So uh, I would like to welcome you very, very warmly. Uh, this is almost the end of the conference. I hope you get a uh, great time here, as well as I. Uh, my name is Mariusz, Mariusz Gil, and this session will be about a completely different approach to design and um, use the, the API. Um, today we've got a plenty of the options how we can design and use API, and, uh, and the REST style is just one of the options. So this topic, I hope, will be um, something like inspiration for you, because I believe that conferences, especially technical conferences, it shouldn't be about the, the, the reading and writing documentation. It should be always about the, the inspiring people. OK, so uh, as I said, my name is Mariusz, Mariusz Gil. I live in um, Poland, in Wrocław, which is a very, very interesting city called City of 100 Bridges. Uh, this is something like. Uh, programming, one of the programming capital in Poland. So on a daily basis, I am run my own company, which is Source Ministry. This is a very, very small consultancy company related to the PHP stuff. I'm a professional PHP developer since 2000, so a uh, couple of years of experience. I saw PHP free on production, <laughs> to be honest. And the uh, rest of my time, I'm working with a Bottega IT Mines. Bottega IT Mines is very, very a uh, specific company. This is a set of, uh, of people uh, interested with sharing experience. Uh, this is not software house, this is not very tough um, training company. This is all about sharing experience and teaching the people how to be a better programmer, better developer, better architect. Um, this is a community conference, right? So for me, community of developers is very, very important. And uh, a couple years ago, in Warsaw, with my two colleagues, uh, we started a small PHP meetup called PHP Earth with uh, this blue elephant logo. Uh, after a couple of years, uh, all the PHP user group uh, from different cities in Poland decided to unite. And right now, there's a single, single huge community of PHP developers in Poland. And uh, I don't know, I don't remember even how many cities are in the community because uh, there are a bunch of different meetups every single, uh, every single month. And uh, this year, it will be a third year in a row where the PHP community organized a conference, a community conference very, very similar to this one, which is a PHP summit. It will be held in the end of the June in Poznań, which is a central, central Poland, so feel invited uh, to join this conference. Uh, and I know that Polish language is very, very uh, difficult, <laughs> and this year the, the PHP summit will be at least 50 percent in English, so feel invited. Okay, so uh, let's go to the main topic of this talk, uh, the GraphQL. Imagine that right now you've got opportunity to write a completely new software. There is a brand new repository, no single file inside. All you've got is a very, very foggy set of requirements. And right now, you can take every single decision, and every single decision may be introduction to, 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 to your project. So what is your first step in, 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 in starting a new project? You know, of course, there are many, many options, depending um, on the size of the projects, on the core of this project, and uh, of course there are some. There is a set of very, very typical approaches. So the first approach you can meet, maybe you already done it. It's of course framework first. What kind of framework we can use to meet these requirements? And you've got probably you, you, you probably started the holy war of of, of uh, choosing the right framework because. Uh, maybe half of your team loves Symfony, maybe the, the other people in your team love, love, loves Laravel or Zen Framework, whatever. Of course, there is not only one approach you can apply, right? You can say, okay, don't start from the framework, let's start from the database. And um, all you need to do is read your requirements, look for from some terms. If you found a term in your requirement, you probably found a class name or maybe a class property. If you found a class, you found a, maybe a name for the table. 
if you found a property, you found a name for the column in the database. And in many projects, this approach works really, really well. Um, because all you need to do is read the mm, requirements, run your code generator, and after maybe 45 minutes, your application, maybe not application, your database schema is designed and you can work on your controllers. Unfortunately, this, this approach has some weaknesses. It's worked very, very well if you have no process inside your application. And even the framework first approach and the database approach are not always, uh, and maybe not only, approaches you can apply. So there's another, the API first, because all we need to do is fulfill the contract We've got some external clients. Um, there is very, very specified, the, mm, and, and very, very specified uh, a communication, and all we need to do is maybe have write a Swagger file and generate some some code. And um, of course, the solution you should apply in your software it always depends, always depends. Um, from my experience, I don't know what kind of software you develop. Um, I'm working mostly on, com on very complex software uh, because the CRUD, I mean the cr Creator Retrieve Update Delete software, should always be generated. Please don't write the CRUD application, generate the CRUDs. Um, if your complex, if your software, if your requirements are very, very complex, maybe there is a different approach where to should start your design. As I mentioned, I, I usually worked with very, very complex software. And for me, this diagram, maybe this is not so, so, so clear to see, is very, very important. Um, you recognize this diagram? It's all about hexagonal architecture, where you've got, of course, very, very, um, the, <laughs> the most important part of your system. I mean, the business logic. This is a core of your system. Um, in many cases, it should be implemented without thinking about the database, about the framework, about the API. Um, to run this application, to run this business um, domain and, and business logic to, to access, to give an access to, to, to the customer, it should be surrounded by some application services and the infrastructure layer. Because without the database the, <laughs> and maybe the, the, without the framework, there is no running application. And this, this code is useless. And uh, I'm talking about this because the API this is only a part of this project, usually. And if you focus too much on your API, because you've got the a lot of API clients, and you allow your, your API design to affect the architecture and design of your, of your business logic, you will have a trouble. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe in next year. So, if you've got your, your, your application um, decoupled from your API layer, it's very, very easy to introduce a different way how you can expose and interact uh, with different clients. Because maybe the REST API is not the only way how you would like to, to, to interact with your API, with your application, sorry. Maybe there is a CLI way how you would like to, 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 to put your data in your domain logic. Maybe there's a full feature graphic user interface with exactly the same set of the feature. And uh, if you allow, or if you choose the, 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 the API framework and the, the, the API layer inside the controllers will have a lot of business logic, it will be very, very hard to introduce a different ports and adapters in your, in your hexagonal architecture. But of course, uh, we use a lot of APIs. I, I, I love REST, to be honest. I love REST uh, because it's very, very convenient and very, very popular. Um, if you would like to work with software um, delivered by other guys, you don't need to even write the full or read the full documentation. All you need to do is take a look on the documentation and uh, if this documentation and project is 100% complied with the, the rest, it's, everything is obvious. You can sit your computer, you can get your computer, sit on a chair and write the code. So, by the way, the, the, the rest architectural style belongs on six, um, 
six elements, which is, of course, the uniform interface. By uniform interface, I mean that in REST you've got uh, uh, resources, right? This, this style is resource-based. So every time you would like to interact with some resource, you've got the others of this resource, and you manipulate with this resource. Um, you can fetch the, the, the resource from the, from the server. Of course, you, you will get a representation with XML, with JSON, whatever. And if you would like to modify this resource, you send a self-descriptive message to the server. And the server know how to handle this message. If you send the post, it's obvious that this resource will be modified. The rest is, m for most of the time, stateless. So it's very, very easy to scale the REST application. It's cacheable. Uh, we are using the HTTP protocol, so, so you can use all cacheable uh, features from, from HTTP protocols to, to, to avoid your server overloading. So the rest is also about the client server, right? So it means that client may evolve with different speed from the server. And at the same time, you can have a client supporting with the different de version of your API. It's also about the layer system. You don't know what is behind, b between the server and the client. Maybe there are a bunch of network switches or whatever. And finally, you have, you have ability to put the code from the server to the client uh, to execute sometimes something extra, um, extra part. And of course, this is, this is, these requirements came from the Roy Fiddling dissertation about the REST architectural style. And from the perspective of developers, it's all about sending messages, right? So this is an example of um, GitHub API usage. We've got the get for the reaction for some issues, uh, sorry, for some reports. And we've got the JSON representation of this resource. It's very, very convenient. I, I think everyone in this room know everything <laughs> about this, uh, this request. If you would like to, to, to put something to the, uh, to the API, all you need to do is just perform a post message. And you've got uh, another representation. The server is using, of course, the, the HPT st HTTP status codes, and you know everything what's happened on the production. So, as I said, I love REST. But unfortunately, at the same time, I really, really hate REST sometimes. Uh, <laughs> let me explain this. Um, in some scenarios, and we'll keep this example, uh, this is still an um, example of GitHub usage. We've got get request for the pull request on specific repository. And we've got uh, the information that the, our process, our request was processed fine, and we've got the response. And unfortunately, this response is huge. This example is taken from directly from documentation. So every time, if you would like to, to get this data, you will receive this information. But, which is more important, this code, this response, contains a lot of links to further resources. Every time if you see something, something underscore URL, this is a location, this is a address of further resource. So quite long answer. And imagine that you would like to fetch some of this data. In many, many scenarios, if you would like to perform data gathering from the, from the uh, REST API. You send the request for the data, you've got the answer. You can analyze this data, and you can, all you can do is just send another request to the same server, right? Maybe in this example, there, there is an option to combine some, some, some requests, but in general, we must rely on server representation on this data uh, and the API. And uh, in most of the time, there is a ping pong between the client and the server. Um, the more data I would like to have, the more ping pong you've got. And all re all the, every single request to the server, of course, is time consuming, right? You've got the latency on the network, you've got the latency on the, the data processing, and so on and so on and so on. And of course, every single request must be processed uh, by the server. 
And maybe if you design a server-side application which communicates with different uh, server-side uh, applications, it's not a problem. But if you're working on application maybe in smartwatch or maybe in just phone and the latency is very very crucial this problem it's huge it's huge because you would like to have a data and you need to let's say execute 15 different calls to the API to avoid this problem some teams expose extra endpoints which are to be honest not 100% compatible with rest because there is a problem with, um, with latency and network pings. We expose extra endpoints just for the particular front end. Let's say we've got a standard API and we've got the mobile API with some data combined to avoid these ping pongs. So this is something like a back and forth front ends problem for microservices architecture. And to avoid this problem, there's a solution, of course. <laughs> A GraphQL. Um, what is exactly GraphQL? GraphQL is a Facebook project. It was proposed, maybe not proposed, it was started in 2012 as an internal Facebook project because they realized that they've got a performance issue on the network. And um, in 2015, after three years of internal development and internal usage, this project was open sourced. And this project is all about changing the way how you expose your data from your application to avoid, for example, a performance issue and network run trips. So in 2012, uh, 15, where this project was announced and open sourced, some companies like GitHub, they decided to abandon their internal projects uh, very, very strictly related to the same topic. So, what is exactly a, a GraphQL? GraphQL is an API query language. The rest is not query language. It's about changing messages. Um, the API query language with server-side runtime for query execution using defined type system. So, to run this, this idea in your software, in your system, the first thing you should do is define a type system. So, what is a type system in GraphQL? So, let's define few, 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 a uh, few objects. It will be a very, very compact schema definition. So, the first thing we've got a enum type called PHP version with some values. And right now, when this information will be delivered to the, to the GraphQL server, we've got the object called uh, PHP version, which is um, an enum value. We can define some types, like type developer with field ID, name, avatar URL, where ID is, of course, the, the identifier of the object, some internal uh, data type, and name and avatar URL is just, just the strings. And as you see, there is an exclamation mark here. Exclamation mark in type definition in GraphQL means that this field this field is, cannot be no label. So the name is mandatory and the avatar URL may be null. And we've got another type, commit, which have ID, date of creation, mandatory, and this commit is maybe reviewed by, by developer. The, the parentheses mean that this is a collection. This is a collection of developers. And you don't know it's one or 100. And finally, there's a field called change, which is also the string. And finally, we've got the package with field ID, name, author, which is one more time developer, released at, works with, which is a collection of enums. And we've got the history. History is a collection of the commit. Okay, so very, very small and naive implementation just to, 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 to show you some concepts. And this is uh, only one part of schema definition. To expose this data to the world, um, you need to perform one operation more, which is define a query. A query definition of the query is just, just another object 
um, which allows you to get some name of the package and the package will be returned. And when this definition will be introduced to the server, you've got an option and ability to ask the server for particular data. So this is a very, very easy um, and simple example of the query. Example, example, example uh, sorry. Uh, exactly this data may be sent as, this, as a string, as a, just a string, uh, let's say to the, to the HTTP endpoint, which is running a GraphQL service. We've got the query, and we would like to ask a package with name sample package. This query returns the package object, and the package object has a name value. So we would like to get exactly this value. So when this request will be processed by the server, you will get a JSON data with the name of this package. Of course, you can ask um, the GraphQL server for more sophisticated um, uh, query, of course, like this. Instead of asking only on for the name field, we would like to ask for ID, name, and also about the author. But the author, it's a completely different type. It's a developer, if, if you remember, and developer type developer has completely different schema. So for the author, we would like to have a name and avatar URL. In the terminology of REST, it probably we will have to perform an extra get request to the server to completely different endpoint to get this data. With GraphQL, you combine your requirements in single query, and this single query will transmit to the server and you've got a, just a single response for all data you asked. So next example. The same query, a little bit extended. We've got the ID, name, author, and we would like to ask for the history of commits of this package. A history is a collection of commits, so every single commit has dedicated structure. So for every single commit, we would like to have information about uh, when this commit was created and who was responsible for review. Reviewer is a developer uh, object, so for the developer object for review of the commit, we would like to have a field name. So imagine how many operation you can save by, by changing the schema of your, of your query. Of course, uh, the key story may be long, maybe very, very long, thousands of comments. So uh, GraphQL allows you also to pass some parameters for every single field you're asking for. And these parameters will be, will be transmitted to the server, and server may react somehow. So for example, in this case, we would like to limit history of the commits, let's say, to 100. And of course, maybe some, some ordering parameters should be introduced here as well. So it's all about changing the, the way how we interact with, with schema. So of course, the server, maybe a, a, a standard a PHP script or JavaScript uh, Node.js server, which is running a GraphQL service on particular endpoint, but it's, not com it's completely independent from HTTP. So you can transmit this query string, it's just a string, um, to the server with, let's say, XML RPC, <laughs> with email, with QE. It's no matter how. It's all about the, the, the data structure. Um, in a few minutes, I would like to show you a real example how it works and how we can achieve and, uh, and what you can achieve using a GraphQL service. But before, Short, um, short introduction about the data. Um, I, I, I'm going to use a GraphQL Hub website with some uh, predefined schema for Twitter data. So this is a part of, of, of GitHub repository for this project. Um, right now, what you see, it's definition, GraphQL definition of the object. It's not written in PHP. Um, this is a representation for Twitter user. 
Twitter user has some um, fields like description, screen name, profile, etc., etc., and there are some embedded extra fields like tweets, which is a collection of the tweets, and so on, and so on, and so on. What you see on this on the screen, it's something like resolve, resolve here and resolve here. When you're asking the server of GraphQL service for solving your query, uh, the server, of course, must know <laughs> how to how to fetch the data. So when you design your schema and you provide an application for GraphQL service, um, you should also provide the information how this data should be resolved. Let's say in this place, of course, it would be a database query. Twitter user, tweet. We've got a text, retweet counter, uh, outer, and the collection of retweets, which is, of course, a collection of tweets. And we've got retweet object. OK, so let me change a window. Okay. So this is a graphqlcup.com, which is a interface uh, for some playground. That's it. And you've got the possibility, ability to write um, graphql query, and this query using the schema available on the server, and your query will be processed in real time, and you will fetch a data. So this project contains a um, few, few <laughs> uh, available API integrated, for example, a Twitter. What you see right now, it's a front end of GraphQL. GraphQL is a um, Node.js application, which is open source. You can download exactly this front end to your application and run exactly the same software with your schema on your server. It still is open source. So right now we've got um, Twitter API. OK, so let's write some queries to this to the service. OK. OK, I'm going to execute query. And I'm going to use a search option. This endpoint is, is visible. OK. Okay. We will got we will get a collection of tweet and every single tweet should have a text. And if my connection is up and running, whoa, whoa, whoa. I made a type. Oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't specify what kind of uh, service I'm going to use because this uh, API uh, allows you to interact with uh, with GitHub API, uh, GitHub, uh, Reddit, GraphQL, Hacker News, and so on. Okay, sorry, my mistake. Okay, and what we've got here. And this is a collection of tweets taken directly from the Twitter. We send this query to the GraphQL server. GraphQL server resolved our query, and the data came from the Twitter. So maybe we would like to have also an ID, and maybe we would like to have information about the created ad, and maybe it would be nice to get inform to have information who was an author of this tweet. So let's ask about the author. But the author, it's another note, another type. So let's get the name. And as you see, you've got a lot of information combined together.
this, this highlighting and, and hints uh, came directly from the schema. So this front end is able to, to, to suggest what kind of fields you would like to perform and fetch. Okay, so we've got the author, and every single author have a collection of the tweets. So let's ask about the tweets. Okay, let's fire up this query. Okay. <laughs> Hello, GraphQL. <laughs> yeah, it's live. <laughs> it's not recorded, it's live. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got the information uh, about the tweet, and this is the author of this tweet. And here we've got a tweet directly made it by this author. And for every single tweet, maybe we can ask for something for more. Retweet count, and maybe the retweets. Okay, so. Every retweet is also, of course, another object, so we can ask for extra fields. Whoa, I made a typo. I made a typo. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. You know, the giving live demo is always <laughs> difficult. Yeah. There's no retreats, no retreats. Yeah, we've got the retreats. Because context matters, that's right. And um, of course, the approach is completely different than REST, completely. Instead of sending, imagine how many requests to the REST service you need to perform to collect this data. Right now, this solution is very, very efficient. Single shot, single response, and of course, the magic is happened on the server. <laughs> Sounds interesting? Instead of exposing very, very hard and fixed API, you give ability to write any single query for your clients. And of course, you expose only the data you would like to expose. Okay, so it was about reading. If you would like to read from your GraphQL service, is just send a query. Um, the question is, what about write? And to be honest, I hate this term. I'm trying to don't use a term write because there's a better term for that. It's not r related to the GraphQL, it's general approach of programming, at least at my, um, my perspective. Write is consequence of change. So uh, maybe I mentioned that I'm very, very tightly coupled with DDD community, and many of my systems are event-based. Events represent a change. So in my system, I would like to store changes and store the effects of the changes. So it's not about writes, it's all about having a change. Um, so this is uh, also a reason why I don't write setters. I don't use setters. The last setters I wrote was about three years ago. And uh, using this approach, writing without setters, we are able to write a finance software, which is able to, to, to count a millions of euro. So instead of writing setters, expose the business behavior of your object. Um, the business methods, no setters. Okay, so uh, in the term of GraphQL, the change is a mutation of your data. So instead of sending a query, you send a mutation request to your server. And of course, this mutation had to be um, introduced before to your server. Right now, this mutation represents um, a registering new reaction for PHP version and, uh, and, uh, and the reaction. 
PHP version is, of course, uh, the, the, the enum type, and reaction input, this is another type in our system. Maybe reaction is made from the user, sorry, user, maybe this is a number of stars, maybe it's a text, whatever, maybe it's another enum with some emojis or something like that. And when this mutation will be delivered, we fired a register reaction, and when this, this, um, this mutation will be performed, the result is just return to reaction. So this is how you can handle um, changes using a GraphQL. Right now, the concept and the specification of GraphQL contains the query types and the mutation. Um, I don't know how many of you are working with event-based system, but um, in event-based systems, you would like sometimes to subscribe your application for some change. And um, if the change was fired somewhere in your system, you don't need exactly to know where it's happened, because the information that something was happened is more and more, more important. And uh, there's an RFC um, request in um, GitHub repository for this project, which is about change notification. When this RFC will be implemented fully, we will have an um, extra, extra type in GraphQL, which is called subscription. You may subscribe your application for some events. This is a part of this, uh, of this RFC. Right now, it's working in Facebook um, using uh, MQTT protocol, but it's, uh, right now it's uh, so integrated with Facebook infrastructure that uh, they didn't decide to, to expose uh, this implementation um, uh, to the world. But yeah, the concept is very, very interesting. Without, you, you will be able to react for the changes in your data without uh, pulling your GraphQL service every single, let's say, five seconds, because you will receive a notification that something was happened. Let's say via IMQP or IMQTT, whatever. And of course, if you would like to um, start playing with GraphQL, which I hope <laughs> you will have um, opportunity to do, is of course the read um, some, some repositories. We are the PHP developers, right? So there's interesting uh, repository called GraphQL PHP, which is 100% um, PHP related implementation of server. You can use this software to expose your data directly from PHP. So when you've got a definition of your type, you can convert this definition to the standard of this library. Yeah, it's just about transforming uh, the GraphQL uh, schema to the class, and nothing more. Uh, so this is definition of object type user directly from documentation, with some fields like first name, yeah, here and the email, which are the string, with some description. Uh, this description may be used by GraphQL, um, the interface, just for the better user experience. So another definition, uh, object called story with some resolvers. Field author will be resolved with this data source. Yeah, I, I hate static calls, so <laughs> there are a bunch of methods how you can improve this design, but every single time where someone will ask about the story, this finder will be fired. The same here, resolve for likes. As you see, uh, this like um, is able to handle an uh, argument like limits with some default value, the same as the history of the commits. And finally, we've got the block story. S some code was removed just to, to, concept, to, to show the concept. And finally, we've got the query. Query must be introduced to the GraphQL server because you are interacting with queries. When this query will be resolved, your PHP code will be executed. And of course, performance of the solution rely on your implementation of resolvers. Because if you've delivered very, very naive implementation, you will be punished by n plus one problem, 
if you iterate some some collections or whatever. Um, I suggest to read, of course, documentation for this for this project. Uh, there are a bunch of possible strategies how you can avoid performance issue like buffering and caching. It's already delivered and it's already there, so just use it. And of course, the first <laughs> the first um, the first place you should visit is GraphQL.org and the repository of of GitHub. And this concept is so interesting that right now. The GitHub, the GitHub API. Right now we are using um, the version three of this API, and this is almost almost everything in REST. Um, the version four of this API will be not REST, will be in GraphQL. And right now you can um, log in to the GitHub with your account, run the explorer, which is also I will be public and uh, using your account, touch your data with GraphQL way. So I made this, uh, made this screen yesterday. Uh, I, I asked <laughs> the GraphQL uh, just for my login and you are able to fetch all the information you would like to perform with every single call, <laughs> using single call, by the way. So the Facebook GraphQL repository, this is the first chat where you would like to, to, to start, where you should start. There is a full specification of GraphQL service. There are a lot of examples, a lot of different clients for different technologies. GraphQL is not about the technology. You can interact uh, with different servers. Maybe this GraphQL service is run by Node.js. Maybe this one is run by, uh, by Java. Maybe this one is made by uh, PHP, whatever. There are a bunch of, of, of linked implementation. And of course, there is a original implementation by Facebook. There's also, of course, the <laughs> ASOM, <laughs> ASOM GraphQL uh, repository, which contains bunch, bunch, bunch of interesting links if you would like to get deeper, dig deeper in this topic. With some presentations, uh, books, slides, and so on and so on. And uh, one more thing. <laughs> it's not a silver bullet. This solution will not solve, it's not going to solve every single problem we've got. It solves a very, very special problem. So if you would like to, to, to expose your API where your clients may decide what kind of data um, should, be, should be fetched, yeah, this is a solution. If your API is very, very simple and you've got maybe not so many clients, it's over-engineering, it's overhead. So don't use it in this particular situation, like general. Um, <laughs> but the real one more thing I would like to say is uh, yesterday was very, very interesting presentation by Michel from Ideato about the refactoring. And there was very, very interesting question, even more interesting question about the architecture of microservices. And uh, Microservices are very, very hot topic, maybe in the last two or three years. Many developers believe that microservice architecture will solve every single problem you've got. No, <laughs> they will not. Um, but we can combine these concepts. We can combine these concepts, GraphQL and microservices. And um, the right implementation of microservices involves many different data stores. I mean, every single microservice you've got should have a dedicated data store. The situation when you've got a monolithic database and a bunch of microservices application integrated by monolithic, monolithic database, it's a bad idea. It's a completely bad idea. Uh, the, the, this microservices should be combined to monolithic software and deployed together. But, if you've got, let's say, 12, 50, maybe 20 microservices, and you would like to expose this data to your clients, because you've got a business client interested with usage of your data, and you expose your internal architecture, how these micro, th microservices, let's say, are designed with RESTful APIs, and your client will have to perform many different 
REST calls to your services, you will have trouble every single time when you decide about the refactoring. Moving a single field from microservice to another microservice will be very, very painful. To avoid this problem, also to avoid a latency and round trip network ping pong, you should always have an API gateway. API gateway is a dedicated component between your client and your microservices fleet, which is able to accept a single call from the client, split this call to separated microservices, fetch the data, and combine the responses from the microservices in single response and send single response to the client. Using the microservices this way, you don't expose your internal architecture and you can modify your internal architecture. You can move, you can split one microservice to four microservices without touching your clients. The contract in this element will be remained. So this element is called an API gateway and if you are running a uh, microservice architecture, you probably know that you are, you've, got, you've got a bunch of solutions ready to use, like let's say Kong. Kong is an uh, API gateway. But what if, if you decide to use a GraphQL service as your API gateway? This picture was taken from the very, very interesting article Link it below, which is uh, sharing data in microservices architecture using a GraphQL. Your clients, like web uh, web app, maybe a mobile app, maybe some other services, is touching your gateway, which is, in example, a GraphQL server, and the clients decide what kind of information should be fetched. There is no approach like backend for frontends. Uh, which is a very, very popular solution of this problem in microservices world. So this API gateway, which is, as I said, GraphQL service, may transmit this query to, to other services and combine the response. And finally, it's no matter what is an internal architecture of this particular microservice. As I said, I, I, I'm using a domain driven design, which is also very, very fitted with, with uh, microservices architecture, where microservices are connected um, between each other with using events and, and, and so on. But when you decide to, to put a GraphQL service to connect them all, you can move everything around without touching your clients, which is, I think, quite interesting option. And even this, this element is also already written and available. It's an Apollo, where you can combine your services and expose a single um, GraphQL uh, service. So I hope you, I hope you uh, feel a little bit inspired to further research, and I strongly, strongly recommend to get um, five minutes of your time, uh, visit the graphql.org and take a, a look on that and think what kind of changes you can achieve using a completely different approach. So, thank you for your time. My name is Maros Gili, if you would like to, to, to follow me on Twitter. <laughs> okay, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you would like to, 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 to chat with me, I'll be around. Thank you.